Well, hello, and thank you for joining us to the next installment of the Exploring Series. My name is Matt, and I'm happy to join you today as we tackle a topic that is a bit of a heavy one, and that is the problem of evil and suffering. Now, I think this is one of those items that we all think about, that we all interface with on a daily basis. I know I've struggled with this, and so as I talk to you today, I'm looking to join with you in coming to a greater level of understanding. I'm not coming to you today as an expert. I don't have it all together. I don't have all this figured out. But I think that we can apply some logic and reasoning to this topic as we consider the biblical worldview and come to, again, a little bit a better, clearer comprehension today. And so, again, the problem of evil and suffering, I think this is the one that keeps a lot of people from faith. I know when I'm sharing my faith, very often people will come back at me and say, well, if God is so good, how come there's so much evil and suffering in the world. And let me first say, I think that's a legitimate question. I really do. I think it should be taken seriously, and that's why we've given it airtime today. And I think the other line of reasoning goes, you know, if God is so good and so powerful, how come he allows so much evil and suffering? And in order to address that, I want to take a page out of the playbook of Jesus. You see, Jesus was a master teacher, and when someone would ask him a very difficult question, he'd often pose a more challenging question in response. And why does he do that? because he's a master teacher. He doesn't just spoon feed his students. He causes people to think critically and to examine their worldview and come to their own conclusions. So when anyone asks me that question, the question is actually loaded with a lot of presuppositions, a lot of assumptions. For example, if you're saying that something's evil, you're, you're setting a value judgment. For example, how do you know something's good? How do you know something's evil? Right? Why do we know that suffering is bad? What I find fascinating is that whether you're religious or you're irreligious, we all agree that evil and suffering are not good, that they're bad. I think that's fascinating. And so as we kind of unpack that a little bit, we have to assume then if we're saying that there's some standard of good and evil somewhere, that there's some moral absolute standard, then there has to be a lawgiver, right? There has to be an introduction of a supernatural entity in this place where we're calling him God that has introduced this, this absolute moral standard. And so if we're going to call something evil or if we're going to call something good, we are making value judgments as we start. And the next thing I want to say to kind of think through critically this issue about evil and suffering is that I want to pose this question. Do you think you make real choices or do you think that you're a robot? And what I found is that all of us live in such a way that we believe we make real choices. We believe that our actions have consequences. And the fact is that if God created us with free will, with, as actual persons, with the ability to make real choices, that means we have the possibility of choosing good and the possibility of choosing evil. And oftentimes we do that. And have you ever noticed that when you mess up in life, when you've sinned or made a big mistake, that God doesn't always come swooping down and stop you from doing it? He allows us the dignity of making mistakes. He allows us the dignity of being actual persons. So if that's the case, we have to understand that if God has not made us robots and we don't, we don't belong to some fatalistic experiment, that there's going to be the opportunity for people to make selfish decisions that is, that's going to be toxic to the relationships around them and self-destructive as well. So with that in mind, I want to move on to another topic, and that would be this, that people often come at me and say, you know, I can't think of a good reason why God would allow evil and suffering. Therefore, there must be no good reason. And I think that is a huge presupposition because let's step back for a minute and think about this. Imagine the totality of all the knowledge in all of the universe. And when you consider any one person's ability to know that 100%, even the best and brightest among us know less than 1% of the total knowledge of all the universe. So within that 99%, surely there is room for a good reason that we haven't thought of. And so one of my main points today is I want to tell you this, that just because you and I can't think of a good reason why God would allow evil and suffering doesn't mean a good reason wouldn't exist. So for example, I'm going to give an example from the scriptures. You may know that Jesus died on what Christians call Good Friday. Jesus was crucified, an act of capital punishment, even though he was innocent, on Passover. And he had 12 apostles who had been following him for a few years. One of the apostles abandons him, right? They, Judas, he goes and hangs himself. And then we are left with 11 apostles, and most of them go into hiding. So imagine the suffering of Jesus. That's pretty important to our concept today, that Jesus suffered abandonment of his closest friends at his darkest hour of his life. Maybe some of you have felt that way. Well, so what did his apostles do? His apostles went into hiding because they were afraid they might get killed next because they had been affiliated with Jesus. And at that point on Friday and Saturday, the Friday is when Jesus was killed, the apostles could think of no good reason why God the Father would have allowed Jesus to suffer this evil and injustice. But then we get to Sunday morning, 
and Jesus rises from the dead, just like he said he would. That offers us new life. And the apostles start to understand what Jesus did for them on that Friday. You see, the Orthodox Christian teaching is that Jesus died as our substitute, that Jesus took the punishment that our sins deserved, and we go from being lost to found. That is, we are lost in a relationship with God, and we are now found in right relationship with God, because when Jesus died on the cross, by putting our faith in him, our sins can be washed away. And when Jesus resurrected from the dead, that is the offer of new life. And so now, days after Jesus' crucifixion, the apostles are able to see how God would allow a time of evil and suffering to achieve an ultimate good. Now, I'm not saying that evil and suffering are good. What I'm saying is that God can leverage evil and suffering, turn it on its head and its ill effects, and achieve an ultimate good, that which is Jesus saving us from our sins, Jesus offering us life after death and fixing the relationship between God and mankind. And it's at that point that the disciples, again, who could think of no good reason why God would have allowed Jesus to die, now they could see the reason why God would have allowed it. And I think that's incredibly powerful to remember. Moving on to a related topic is that there's redemptive potential in suffering. You see, Jesus' life was one that allowed us to achieve redemption because of what he did. The idea is that he paid the redemption price on the cross so that we could have our sins washed away. And Jesus had to suffer for that to happen. So God introduces to us this redemptive potential of suffering. You know, we may not know why God allows certain evil and suffering, but we know the one reason it can't be. It can't be that he doesn't love us. Otherwise, he wouldn't have become involved. You see, Jesus Christ literally came and suffered like us. He became one of us, got his hands dirty, and he literally bled in our place. Again, we may not know why God allows evil and suffering, but we know the one reason it can't be. It can't be that he doesn't love us. You know, I hear people say sometimes, God's not doing enough about the evil and suffering in this world. And my answer to that would be, God has been more of an activist toward evil and suffering than any human being ever has. So as we wrap up today, I want you to think about these concepts. I think they're rich. I think that they can show us that God can take the ill effects of evil and suffering, that he can reverse their effects such that he achieves an ultimate good. And I want to leave you with a quote from Dr. William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig is a pretty world famous uh, PhD who defends the Christian faith with logic and reason on a number of university campuses. So I'm going to paraphrase one of his statements here, and I'm going to warn you it's a little bit hard to comprehend up front, but I'm going to repeat it twice, and I want you to think about it later if it doesn't immediately resonate with you. It took me a while. It may have taken a few days for me to chew on it before I really got it. And again, this statement goes on the presupposition that God has given us the dignity of being actual persons who have real choices. That is, we have the ability to choose good, but also the ability to choose poorly, to choose evil. So here's the statement. It may not have been an option, given human freedom, that a world with as much good in it as this one could have existed with less suffering. I'm going to say it one more time. It may not have been an option, given human freedom, that a world with as much good in it as this one could have existed with less suffering. And to clarify, I'm not saying evil and suffering are good. I'm saying that God uses evil and suffering and turns it on its head so that he achieves an ultimate good that was better than would have otherwise been achieved. And that encapsulates the Christian worldview on pain and suffering. And we know that the discussion doesn't end here, that we couldn't have covered all the topics. So if you have any questions, we would love for you to reach out to us at exploring at trinitynewlife.com. Thank you for joining us.